afternoon. Welcome. My name is Dr. Lisa Coleman, and I am the Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation here at NYU. We are very excited about this program today, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I want to uh, first just thank uh, uh, Dr. Matthew Fry Jacobson for agreeing and accepting the invitation. We're very excited for this conversation, Contingencies of Whiteness. And I will uh, introduce our distinguished guest and speaker in just a few moments. Um, I have the opportunity to lead the amazing team within the Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity and Strategic Innovation, or OGI for short. Uh, so let me just uh, say thank you to that team. It takes an extraordinary amount of work to put something like this together. And, um, and we've been doing this uh, quite a bit this summer. So thank you, thank you to my team. Um, first, before we get started, if you look at the bottom of your screen, if you need closed captioning, it's right there. You can click on the closed captioning uh, button. I'll give you a moment to do so. And uh, that will allow you to have uh, closed captioning for this event. Let me begin by begin the ways that I always begin. And so many of you have heard me say this before. Uh, I hope that everyone is taking very good care. Uh, people keep saying this is the new normal. It is not normal. Uh, I've been saying it's the new unusual and it is. Um, lots of things have happened. We've seen lots of different pressures uh, across the uh, US and globally. Um, and so we're experiencing exacerbated disparities, xenophobia, all kinds of, um, of obviously pressures on our homes, our, our health and our family and loved ones. So again, I hope everyone is taking good care. Uh, I also wanna take this time to acknowledge all the people who are allowing us to take good care, all the people who are working behind the scenes, um, of course, our healthcare workers, but all those people who take care of us as we all went to shelter in place. Uh, many of us went home. Some of us went to homes that, weren't un that were not safe. Uh, some of us, um, of course, are in small homes. So recognizing the differential impact that this pandemic has had, as well as um, those people who are working in um, to clean the hospitals, to clean um, our, our, our homes, uh, our facilities, et cetera. So thank you for all of those essential workers who are doing a tremendous job. I would also like to take this moment to uh, thank our ancestors and all of the people who paved the way for us to be here today, uh, including people who've given their lives. Um, and I'd also like to uh, pay homage and recognize the land upon which we stand and occupy uh, across the globe and uh, the indigenous peoples whose lands we uh, stand on. So I'd like to take 10 minutes uh, 10 minutes, excuse me, 10 seconds of silence to recognize our ancestors and our lands. Thank you very much. And finally, I want to thank uh, our uh, NYU libraries for partnering with us to increase access to the Summer Reads selection. Uh, as I said before, it takes a village to get all of these things uh, aligned. And um, certainly, we would not be able to do this without uh, Austin Booth and, of course, our team member, uh, Karen Jackson Weaver, uh, Dr. Karen Jackson Weaver, for so work, uh, work in creating supporting materials uh, that we're excited to share with you. And again, thank you to my entire team. You are amazing um, and you, you really are rock stars. Uh, thank you. Uh, today, we're pleased to welcome you, as I said, and this is part of our NYU Be Together initiative. Uh, some of you know, uh, have heard me talk about this before, but this is part of the NYU Summer Reads conversation for, and of course, our presidential letter and, the NY, and our provost uh, made this announcement. And it's part of the initiative to make global change across NYU's network by acting and transforming and innovating together. Of course, this initiative builds upon the Being at NYU assessment um, where we collected close to 22,000 respondents. Um, and from this foundation of data, we are uh, going to build and grow and reimagine who we are uh, and allow for some co-creation. As we know, 
co-creation amongst our fa faculty, students, and staff in innovative uh, ways, and whether those are hackathons or new um, uh, productions from our Tisch School of the Arts, um, the entire community has, uh, has is being galvanized around these efforts. We know that recent media coverage has brought much needed attention to the persistent violence, um, disparities, racism, um, against marginalized communities and, of course, against uh, people of African descent, sparking calls to action across the nation and globally. These incidents have uh, foregrounded the fault lines and disparities that, for some, seem new, but for many, are the realities in which uh, we have lived. So these realities are ongoing, deep rooted and woven into many of our practices. And we, of course, saw this in the being at NYU assessment. Our work is, uh, is to um, strengthen our NYU community, as I said before, and bring us all together to address these pernicious and pervasive, pervasive issues of racism, sexism, heterosexism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, um, ableism so that we can engage the benefits and build on the strength of our diversity within our local and global communities. Um, we see this as about change to take action. And if, uh, if we are uh, uh, um, very much, this is very much about taking the right steps to address and take action within our community to foster a greater sense of community and, um, and, um, and transparency. Last week, we had a held a panel discussion uh, entitled Interrogating Racist Ideologies, Free Speech and Hate Speech, a Critical Conversation with NYU Students, uh, Faculty, and Alum. Thank you to all of the participants, including um, our student participants and our faculty participants for that panel. In June, we hosted a Juneteenth program in conversation with um, Rachel Swarns, as well as a panel discussion on um, Blackness, Racism, Racism, and Protest with um, some professors internal. Uh, Kirk A. James and Jennifer Morgan, and then some external uh, professors as well. In May, we held a panel discussion on coping with con and contextualizing anti-Asian racism and pandemics, and thank you to all who participated. In addition, um, we have lots of lots of ongoing efforts um, including our responsive dialogues training and guidance document, our microaggressions and anti-racism information, uh, our GLMI, Global Leadership uh, Institute, and as well as our inclusive teaching faculty seminars, uh, and then the things, of course, that have been announced by the Office of the Provost and the Office of the President, including uh, efforts uh, for our James Weldon Johnson Fellows and our MLK Scholars Programs. Um, we encourage everyone to visit our website and all of the information that I just mentioned is there. Uh, we will drop this information into the chat so that you're able to um, access it. This program today is also part of our NYU Summer Reads program where we offer three texts for reflection, discourse, and engagement. Toward uh, uh, and these texts uh, complement the NYU Reads Summer Assignment of Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy. Uh, so. Uh, these, we've had three, this is the third of, um, of three conversations. Our first conversation was with Nell Painter, where we focused on the history of white people. Our second conversation, which is now on our website, the second conversation was with our own NYU faculty member, Kenji Yoshino, uh, and the hidden assault on our civil rights. Uh, so thank you uh, for that discussion. And today's feature, of course, uh, is uh, uh, Dr. Matthew Fry Jacobson, um, Whiteness of a Different Color, and I'm uh, moving into that introduction. Uh, the slogan for uh, Summer Reads is educating and learning together for action and transformation, and that's exactly why we're here today. Um, as we gather to, uh, for today, what I would also like to say is we will be taking live Q&A from the audience. Um, so given the size of the audience, we have over 700 people registered for this, uh, or close to 700 people. We um, will, would like you to drop your questions in as they come to you. Um, and then those questions will be curated and sent to me and I will be able to ask those questions of Dr. Jacobson at the end of the presentation. Unfortunately, we will not be able to get to all of the questions, so I will group some of them. Um, we will of course, get to as many questions as we can, and we will be reviewing the questions as a way to help direct future um, programming, resource creation, as well as the guide that will follow um, this um, talk. Now, it's my great pleasure to honor and welcome uh, Professor Jacobson. Uh, Dr. Matthew Fry Jacobson earned his doctorate from Brown University in 1992 and is the William Robertson Co-Professor of American Studies and History at Yale University. 
He's the author of seven books on race, politics, and culture in the United States. Odetta's Grain of Sand, 2019, The Historian's Eye, Photography, History, and the American Present, 2019. What have, you, what have they built you to do? The Manchurian Candidate in the Cold War America, 2006. Roots to White Ethnic Revival in the Post-Civil Rights Era, 2005. Barbarian Virtues, the, the United States Encounters Foreign Peoples at Home and Abroad, 2000. Whiteness of a Different Color, European Immigrants and the Alchemy of Race, 1998. And Special Sorrows, a Diasporic Im uh, imagine, excuse me, Imagination of Irish, Polish, and Jew Jewish Immigrants in the United States, 1995. He has, also, he has also served as creator and writer and lead researcher for a long way from home, The Untold Story of Baseball's Desegregation, uh, Hammer and Nail Productions, 2019. And the film garnered a Golden Telly Award in the category of gener general television production, also in 2019. His teaching on race focuses on race and US popular culture, 1790 to the present, including US imperialism, immigration, migration, and popular culture, civil rights, and the juridical uh, structures of US citizenship, in addition to documentary studies and public humanities. And I would like to say on a personal note, it is a, a great pleasure to have Dr. Jacobson with you, with us. I've had the pleasure of teaching uh, so many of his texts in, um, in my own courses. And so thank you for being with us today, uh, Professor Jacobson. I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Jacobson and he's going to present for about 10 minutes and then I will come back and ask him some questions. And then we will go into, of course, the Q&A with our audience. So I'd like to invite Professor Jacobson to join me now. Hello. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, and thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm really, I would say I'm delighted to be here with you. I am not really with you, obviously, but um, we're doing our best, right? Um, I will try to be brief in my comments because I'm very eager to hear what's on your minds and to, to field your questions. But I did think I would take a few minutes to lay out some general ideas. Um, it seems to me that the challenge of our moment is on the one hand, to really meet some of the emergencies that we're faced with um, that are of pretty recent vintage. Um, you might think of the post-Ferguson moment. You might think of the post-2016 um, election moment. You might think of the, the post, uh, you know, the, the emergence of Black Lives Matter and all that that represents, uh, the, the children in cages and all that that represents. So there are real emergencies that we're facing with and that we're faced with and it's really important to, to face them as emergencies. At the same time, they are rooted in a very, very, very deep history and it's important to get our minds around that and to really understand the ways in which all of the anomalies that we that we see before us are actually rooted in a much deeper history. So I thought what I would do as a start is just, I wanna kind of take both ends of the timeline of US history. I wanna give you a snapshot of the revolutionary generation and the framers and how, how race was figuring in their thinking. And then I want to fast forward to the Obama and Trump years and, uh, and think about what we're seeing currently as, as um, legacies of that deeper history. Like I said, I'll try to I'll try to be brief. So as for the framers, the one of the most important laws in U.S. history, and it's it's one that um, a lot of people are not aware of, is the first naturalization law. It was written by the first Congress in 1790, um, when they sat down to figure out who is eligible to come to this new republic and become a citizen. Um, and the the key clause in that law is free white persons, free white persons would be eligible for citizenship. Now, they debated this every which way. They debated, um, should nobles and aristocrats from other countries be eligible? Should uh, people who, are, who hold property in other um, countries and therefore are stakeholders in other societies, should they be eligible? Uh, should Catholics and Jews be eligible? Um, should people petitioning for citizenship have to provide witnesses to their good character? Should there be a residency requirement? They turned this upside down and backwards uh, every which way. Um, but race never entered the debate. Um, the presumption that free white persons would be eligible for citizenship went straight from presumption to law without any discussion at all. Now, this is really a, a portentous law um, in both meanings of that word, both what it portended for American history as it unrolled over time, but also portentous in the sense of what it tells us 
about our political culture. So the reasons um, for the kind of easy settling of the question on behalf of free white persons, um, there are two different dimensions to it. One, one is a logistical dimension that in the, the setting of a settler democracy, uh, statutory law in the colonial period had used and, and uh, had used the word white and the concept white in a lot of different ways to delimit rights and responsibilities, uh, like the ability to participate in the militia, for example. Um, a notion like domestic tranquility, which um, you know, makes its way into the founding documents, in this setting of a settler democracy is actually erased it's a race concept, domestic tranquility. Uh, and the, the chief um, challenges are Indian wars on the one hand and slave revolts on the other. Um, and these, um, these kind of racialized menaces defined the duties of the citizen soldier uh, in this young settler democracy. And so at the very practical level, that's one of the reasons why whiteness was, was so easy for that first Congress to settle upon. Another reason and I think it's the deeper, maybe in some ways more interesting and, and also the troubling one, um, is at the level of philosophy. In Enlightenment thinking, um, European thought and Euro-American thought, concepts like reason and rationality uh, were also always already raced uh, as European or as white and, and gendered too as, as male. Um, so of course we the people would be white. Now, the reason for this, the, the radicalism of the revolution, and, and you know, from the 21st century perspective, the we, the people that they settled on, um, white male property holders, seems narrow indeed. Um, but the radicalism of the revolution really was to take traditional lines of authority that were vertical and ran downward from the crown. And you can imagine kind of turning the model on its side and creating um, horizontal lines of authority that would run between the people, not, not from the monarchy downward, but um, through the people um, horizontally. And the presumption in this setting was that, um, first of all, this, this was an experiment and it was a fragile political experiment. And as such, it was not suited to just any old group of chance comers. Uh, the framers thought that the virtues required of the self-governing polity, um, reason, rationality, but also wisdom, forbearance, farsightedness, public mindedness, um, all of the virtues that would allow uh, this new kind of polity to function were already figured in enlightenment thought as European or as white traits or as traits that were out of the common reach of non-white peoples. The 1790 Free White Persons Clause encodes and enshrines this presumption in law. Uh, and it, it wrote whiteness into normative citizenship in the New Republic in ways that would have lasting effects for centuries to come. Um, even while the circle of we the people did become wider over time, including eventually the freed slaves, including immigrants uh, from all over the world, including peoples of incorporated territories, uh, and including women as, as voters. Um, despite that expanding circle of we the people, um, that core presumption has never been completely disrupted. Now, the portent of 1791 has to do with what it, as I said, what it portended for ensuing US history. So all of the millions of people who came uh, into the polity by uh, either Ellis Island or Castle Garden, that whole history of European immigration uh, it was underwritten by the 1790 law. I mean, a century and more later, people were coming into the country on the basis of that free white person's clause. So that's, that's one portent. Chinese exclusion, almost a, almost a century after the free white person's clause was written, was really based on that logic. Since Chinese immigrants were aliens ineligible for citizenship, they were uniquely vulnerable to the violence of the anti-Chinese movement and the political violence of Chinese exclusion. There was not a politician on the scene who was beholden to any Chinese voter because of the 1790 law and therefore the Chinese exclusion law was, uh, was a kind of a steamroller uh, on, on behalf of, of white privilege. Same thing could be said um, further down the line. In the mid 20th century, Japanese American internment was also premised on that same logic 
1790 and the vulnerability of, of um, aliens you know, ineligible for citizenship, which was the kind of legal niche that Japanese immigrants inhabited. Okay, so that's, that's some of the history that the 1790 law lays the ground for. Um, what it tells us is that racism is not merely a stain on democracy or a contradiction to democracy um, as, as we kind of naturally view it now. But for the framers, as they saw it, racism was the guarantor of this fragile experiment in Republican government or democracy. It was the exclusions based on race that gave this experiment a chance as far as they were concerned. So racism and democracy have been mutually constitutive in North America. And it's really only relatively recently, it's really since the civil rights era, that there's been a robust public language and logic and, and at least a partial national consensus um, calling this into question. So racism and democracy in the context of North America have been like one of those figure and ground puzzles where if you look at it one way, it looks like a vase. And if you look at it another way, it's two faces uh, in profile facing each other. Um, that's, that's what I mean by mutually con constitutive. For the framers, race and their racism and the exclusions that their racism underwrote were what were going to make democracy possible. Now, I should emphasize here, I'm not saying this approvingly. I'm not saying that democracy depends on this kind of thinking. I'm just saying that that, that was the way the framers were looking at it and that what was, was what was written into democracy as it has been practiced in North America. Fast forward to the Obama and Trump years. Now, phrases like fit for self-government or fitness for self-government um, have pretty much dropped out of our common language. It was common enough in the 19th century. And in the 19th century, whether it was in the context of reconstruction or whether it was in the context of the debates over uh, the annexation of Hawaii or uh, the insurrection in the Philippines, um, you didn't have to go further than the front page of your daily paper to find the phrase uh, fitness for self-government in, in uh, the way that, that political judgments were being made about uh, the world's peoples. Now that the phrase itself, fit for self-government, fades in mid 20th century uh, American discourse against the backdrop of decolonization globally and uh, the civil rights movement domestically. Um, but I would argue that the idea of fitness for self-government never fully disappears. So Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon, when they talk about the governance of Vietnam, you can see the remnants of that kind of raced idea of fitness for self-government. Uh, Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton, their language around the war on crime, similarly, they're talking about urban spaces and race in ways that, that you can see the echoes or hear the echoes of some of those earlier presumptions. When Donald Rumsfeld talked about the governance of Iraq, similarly, there were presumptions about, about governability and governance uh, that, were, that um, Teddy Roosevelt would have been comfortable with and familiar with. Uh, birtherism and the libels against our first black president, that he must be a usurper. You can see that as a kind of echo of the logic of 1790. And of course, uh, Donald Trump's characterizations of the threat posed by immigration, for example, his discussion of uh, a city like Baltimore and its population, his libels against Baltimore, uh, or his identification of shithole countries, all of, all of that is based on like, the same kind of premise that, that shaped the 1790 logic. Um, that, and it's important to underscore, on a bipartisan basis, right? Johnson, Nixon, Reagan, Clinton, Trump. Um, they're harking back to and bespeaking this logic of the 1790 naturalization clause that fitness for self-government is raced and that it's raced as white. It's so our problem is that it's not just that some people hold ideas about human hierarchy and their own superiority. Um, it's that our political culture was established on patterns of inclusion and exclusion that have never been fully disrupted. They've been, they've been jarred loose a little bit, but they've never been fully overturned or fully disrupted.
So if it's true that the frank language of fitness for self-government has gone underground, uh, you don't really hear people saying this out loud, uh, though a century ago um, it was everywhere. It's also true that a second dimension has been added to that 1790 logic in the years since uh, the 1964 and 1965 Civil Rights Acts, let us say. That is, the presumption of a normatively white citizenry, 1790, has been weaponized as white grievance in the years since the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, in the civil rights years themselves, people talked about backlash, the kind of politics of backlash that someone like George Wallace represented, and even, even aspects of, of Nixon's campaign represented. Um, then you had critics kind of cut against that and say, it's not really backlash, it's, it's always frontlash. Anything that looks like backlash, when you look at it more closely, you realize the, the white resistance to black liberation um, actually precedes black liberation. So it's, it's not a backlash exactly. But what's become clearer um, over the generation or so since the civil rights era is that this, it isn't just a backlash politics. That's too narrow and too, too shallow uh, for what we're actually seeing. What has become clearer over time is a broader and deeper politics of white displacement. Uh, that's an anxiety over the loss of whites proper, I'm putting proper in heavy square, scare quotes here, an anxiety over the loss of whites proper place in the political order. Um, so there was a minute after the 2008 election uh, when we elected Barack Obama that it might have looked like we had, were overcoming the racism um, that was written into the political culture. We were a nation capable of electing a black president it was very exciting um, and, should, and is, is not nothing. We should, we should cling to that as, as a sign of, of what is possible. Um, the op optimism of that moment really lasted for about a minute, however. Um, the first African-American church burning of the Obama era took place uh, about four hours after the election was called for him. Um, and the opposition to the first black president, um, you know, the, the, the refusal to seat his uh, Supreme Court pick, uh, the filibusters, the, the really rough language about, about breaking him and not giving him any, uh, you know, and I'm talking about the Congress now, um, breaking him and not, and not giving him um, any opportunity to, to make, uh, to gain any traction. Like that level of, of opposition, I think, speaks to the kind of politics of white displacement and grievance. Um, that is a product of the post-civil rights era for sure, but finds its resonance in a political culture that has been, that has long privileged whiteness as the hallmark of citizenship. So when you have a black president in the White House, you get a vicious anti-immigration politics, even though the immigration numbers were actually declining. When you have a black president in the White House, you get spikes of Islamophobia, uh, that even surpassed those in the immediate post 9-11 period. Now, if we take the Obama and Trump years together, what we see is the political consequences of demographic change on the one hand and a serious post-civil rights shift towards a more inclusive and democratic politics. Let's be clear, there have been some achievements. So we see that on the one hand and we also see the slide toward a minor, minoritarian government on the basis of white supremacism, on the other hand. So the Southern strategy in uh, the, the early Nixon years captures white resentments for one party. Uh, in the 90s and after, and especially in the 2000s, there's this history of gerrymandering and voter suppression. Um, more recently, we see the engineering undercount of the census. All of this is calculated to extend the rule of a group that everyone knows is in the minority now and will be an even smaller minority in the years to come. And race is at the very center of this ruling strategy. Um, it's, that's been the case ever since Nixon launched his law and order campaign and the Southern strategy. Um, but it's been even more pronounced with Trump at the helm. It's impossible to understand our current red state, blue state politics absent the questions of race and racism. Uh, I should be clear, this isn't a knock on conservatism as a set of political ideas. It's an observation about the organizational and strategic behavior of one of our major political parties. So our challenge 
is to, to note both uh, the kind of outlier aspects of Trumpism in our politics, the broken norms, the kind of sui generis uh, sort of White House comportment. There's so many things about, about the Trump administration that break the mold of politics as we know it. And it's important to reckon with that and to, to strategically think about how to, how to meet it. But at the same time, to understand uh, the deep historical rooting of Trumpism's white supremacism in the political culture. Trump is an anomaly born of the post-Obama moment but he's also homegrown in the soil of 1790, as it were. And so the challenge before us is to meet the short-term emergencies while also taking a long view of our history and recognizing, and here's the historian in me, uh, that 1790 wasn't as long ago as you might think. And I will stop there, and I'm really eager to hear your questions. Thank you so much for that overview uh, and thank you for taking us and uh, making those linkages between those deep, those deep roots in our political philosophical systems as well um, as today. So I'm gonna start um, by asking a few questions and we have some questions from the audience so I will begin um, by integrating a few of those questions. So the first question is, really goes back to this, uh, to you talking about 1790, right? And so uh, in that moment, and then of course you fast forward it to, to Obama. So let's, let's, I'm gonna stay in the early 1900s now and go back a little bit. And it, can you talk to us a little bit about um, the other sort of the evolution, right? So if, as we move, as you know, through from 1790 to 1924, where we have the National Origins Act, right? And so can you talk to us a little bit about that industrial age as sort of the, the, the mapping of whiteness in that particular moment in the ter turn of the 20th century? Sure. Yeah. And let me just underscore here. I mean, this is, you know, um, in one of the prompts that you sent me by email, we, you talked about intersectionality. And this is, this is one of those places where, um, the contributions of Asian American studies, for example, are just um, are just uh, so enriching of um, a Black studies tradition that has focused so much on slavery. Because one of the things, when you look, and this is where 1790 really comes from. If if you look at the operations of race in U.S. political culture from the perspective of Asian American history, what you realize immediately is that. While slavery, of course, was was the great horror, or one of the great horrors of of um, European expansionism and the the deep history in North America, um, it wasn't the full problem because once you once you strip away um, slavery as an institution, you're still left with the problem of this racialized citizenship that is much it's much easier to see in the case of Asian Americans maybe than in the case of African Americans, but it's it's another dimension to the problem. Um, the you know one of the things there there are many accidents in in our history. One is that the framers used really universalist language when they talked about. Um, when they talked about human rights, even though we know that they didn't exactly mean that. Um, and, and it's been our good fortune that we have a universalist language um, about, about men being tr created equal that is then picked up and used later on by people like Martin Luther King in ways that, that the framers didn't exactly mean it. Their usage of the word white uh, in 1790 is another one of those. It's, it's, it's much broader than the term they probably would have used if they foresaw people like my grandparents, the Yiddish speaking Jews from Russia coming down the pike, right? So the word white in the citizenship law, um, it allowed for the coming of all sorts of people beginning really with the Irish in the 1840s in huge numbers, um, and then followed by the waves from Eastern and Southern Europe later in the century, who were not at all the people that the framers wanted or, or uh, had in mind when they used the word white. So one of the things that you get when you look at European immigration through the prism of race is you can kind of see how race is deployed as a language to meet the perceived crises of, of problematic populations coming in, right? So, so the white persons who were comfortably identified in 1790 suddenly look really problematic when they include the Irish or the Italians or the Jews later in the 19th century. 
And so what, what you see in the latter part of the 19th century is a kind of racial adjustment where those groups are standing on the, on the bedrock of their white privilege of um, accessible citizenship. They're standing on the bedrock of the white person's clause, which is absolutely crucial. We can't lose sight of that. But they also did become pariah groups and their pariah status was, was couched in racial terms. So these groups from, I mean, they became in the latter half of the 19th century, the, the, um, the races of Europe, not the white race, but the races of Europe. And there was like 37 of them by some schemes, right? And they were predictably hierarchically ordered from the lightest skin to the darkest skinned. Um, but that fracturing of whiteness was a way of managing the perceived crisis that uh, mass immigration from unexpected areas was presenting. So one of the ways that you can think about, um, and, and not just the 19th century, but you can think about our current moment in similar ways that that race is in in our political culture is one of the languages that's used to resolve the contradictions between a capitalism on the one hand that wants all laborers whoever they are from anywhere in the world bring them we need them and especially in the industrializing period but you might say the same thing about the the, the period now of of agribusiness for example and huge kind of service industries capitalism wants laborers no matter who they are Democracy retains that kind of sense of fragility that I talked about from the 1790s, that, that there are people who might serve us well as laborers who are not going to serve us well as, as citizens in the thinking of some people. And race becomes the language that, that kind of manages those contradictions. Um, it becomes uh, especially acute in the latter part of the 19th century, um, in part because of, of um, the emancipation of slaves, in part because of the massive waves of immigration, not only from Europe, but also from Asia. Um, it becomes a kind of flashpoint in the, in the 19th century. I would say it's a flashpoint again in the post-civil rights era though, um, with with uh, in the post 65 regime of, of a kind of relaxed immigration law and the ways that, that um, the peopling of North America in the 70s, 80s and 90s came to seem a, a crisis to some people. And then let's go back to something that you just actually were talking about, which is about um, European immigrancy and right and migration into the US and this and sitting on this sort of the, the precipice of whiteness. And so could you just talk a little bit more about that migration about that movement into whiteness as you do it obviously in your text and that is uh, actually comes from some of our questions here. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so um, I'm just trying to think about the order I want to try to, to lay this out in. So well, let's start with the capitalism piece. So so you have really after the 1830s 30s or so, you just have the kind of takeoff point of the Industrial Revolution in North America. And in particular, and that's, that's um, sped up after the Civil War when uh, transcontinental railroad lines have really integrated um, a continental market, right? And, and that's when American industry really just begins to take off. And so there's this period of, of several generations where um, people from all over the world are, are you know, and, and it's not a case of kind of pre-capitalist to capitalist movement. It's what we're, what we're seeing is disruptions of capitalism reaching their tentacles into the countryside of the rural south in the United States, of um, the, the rural countryside in a place like Italy or, or Russia. Um, so people all over the world are becoming displaced and they're, they're undertaking short-term movements to nearby cities like Atlanta or Warsaw, but they're also um, undertaking um, trans transoceanic um, voyages of some distance. So from, from Germany or Italy or Ireland or China to the United States. Um, and the United States was not alone as a receiving country. People, people were, were moving all over the world, but the United States was, was a huge receiving country. 
And in the industrializing period, there, was, um, there were many reasons to leave where you were. And, to, and some of them had to do with the, the politics of, of peoplehood in the homeland, like the East European Jews, for example, were escaping the perils of anti-Semitism very much uh, the way that uh, Southern African Americans were escaping the perils of the Jim Crow South. So some of it is rooted in, in a politics of peoplehood, but uh, most of it is rooted in the kind of, of economics of a capitalizing global economy. Um, those millions of, of European immigrants who arrive in the United States, as I said, they come in um, on the basis of the free white persons clause. And so they, they have rights, they have the access to citizenship, um, but their presence, as their presence um, is perceived as being more and more problematic, they're discussed in racialized terms as kind of problematic races, un unfit for self-government. And the, the language around that is, is quite frank. The, the anti-immigrant politics um, that really starts to take hold in the 1890s and, and is crystallized in the 1924 immigration law, which is highly restrictive law, um, that whole debate is really couched in a racialized language of fitness for self-government. And the reasons why um, Northern and Western European peoples are, are better frankly, and, and more fit for self-government than, um, than the peoples of, of further east and further south in Europe, but, but all of Asia um, and, and, um, and certainly Africa and the Americas as well. Thank you so much. So we have a question, um, and this links some of the conversation, I think, um, around today. So obviously we've seen social movement, we've seen protests and lots of activity today. And you mentioned um, sort of BLM and, and the other movements that have been happening. And this is, question is really about the movements, right? And so how do you, how do you see these movements as, um, as impactful or not? And in comparison or contrast to rights earlier social movements, particularly during the civil rights and, um, and the you know, 1950s and 60s era. Yeah, I think that, um, I think we're in, a, in a, a really important moment. I think we're in a highly dangerous moment. I don't wanna understate that. I mean, I think that the dangers we're facing are enormous. Um, I do think that we're in a strangely hopeful moment too at the same time, because you know, what we've seen in the in the, the BLM era, but especially in the last couple months, um, I think that we've seen a, a kind of breadth of coalition building and a breadth of understanding that we weren't necessarily seeing even even ten years ago. I think that that um, white people are hearing the discussions of policing and criminal justice in a different way after the George Floyd tape. Um, you know, and it's, it's tragic that it, it took that. Um, you know, people of color have been talking about these issues for generations, generations. Um, you know, and then there's the moment of the kind of Rodney King video in the 90s, but, but it took a, the kind of, um, I think the volume of cases brought in by kind of cell phone witness, I think is, is really important. Um, and I think that the potential, I mean, you know, the, the kind of multiracial, multigenerational, multivocal throngs that we've seen taking to the streets over the last, you know, six or eight weeks is something qualitatively different in our politics than, than we've seen for a generation. And it's been really fascinating um, you know, God rest his soul, thinking about John Lewis, but having his passing be a moment to really, for the nation to reflect on where we've been and where we are and to kind of get our minds around, you know, what, what was the accomplishment of the civil rights era and what is the post of post-civil rights? What does it mean and what do we want to make it mean and how are we going to make it mean something um, productive? I think that Lewis's passing has been a really important kind of national moment of reflection on our own history and, and what is possible. And, you know, the workers of SNCC, um, there's this great quote, one of them was talking about the, the um, 
voter registration campaigns in, in places like Mississippi in 1964 and talked about the revolutionary patience that was required to do that kind of work. And I think that that's a beautiful formulation because um, we tend to equate revolution with impatience and maybe that impatience is important. But I think revolutionary patience is going to be the key in a political culture like ours. And I think that um, it's been really heartening to see even um, you know, amid the dangers of the, the kinds of forces that the government has deployed in the streets to meet the protests, it, has, is, it shouldn't surprise us, but it's shocking. Um, but the courage in the face of that and people coming back night after night you know, in, in, uh, in cities across the country, I think that's really important. And I think it's, it's saying something about the revolutionary patience that we're feeling and, and what we might be able to make possible out of this moment of, of emergency. Um, and so another question, um, which kind of goes back to you uh, when you were talking about white grievance, right? In this, uh, in the Trump, in the Trump era. And so we had a conversation with Nell Painter as well. And she, uh, in one of her articles, um, wrote about uh, in terms of making America great again, in quotes, right? This idea of a different kind of marked white identity, right? As, as contrasted to earlier periods of time and now, and in some ways you too have, 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 have illustrated that. So could you talk a little bit more about this idea of white grievance and weaponization in terms of these areas of exclusion? Sure, yeah. So, um, you know, in the beginning really in the latter 1960s and then picking up in the 1970s, there was what, what was called the white ethnic revival, which was this um, and I'm a product of that, by the way. I mean, this is, this is how I come to this field is I was, I was in uh, my first year in college was right at the height of that. It was the year after the bicentennial when everyone was kind of history crazy and history mad. And it was in the, in the wake of, of the Roots miniseries and everyone was talking about genealogy and their family history. And everyone, as, as someone in the nation put it, everyone wanted a ghetto to look back to. That's really important. And it's, it was an important dynamic of the moment. That, but that's kind of where I, I entered the discourse was in that kind of roots phenomenon. But one of the important aspects of that, and there's a leftward leaning aspect of that, and there's also a rightward leaning one. But in a general way, the roots phenomenon among white ethnics was this kind of leaping out of the melting pot after, you know, a generation really of, of assimilationism, not just assimilation, but staunch assimilationism. Uh, a jettisoning of, of anything, any identity that wasn't straight ahead American, right? Um, suddenly these groups come leaping out of the melting pot and they say, we're not, we're not white, we're, you know, we're Polish, we're not white, we're Jews, we're not white, we're Italians, um, we're not Americans, we're Italian Americans. And this, the kind of um, new energy for a redefinition, it, it really comes out of the civil rights moment, both in terms of adapting models of group and group politics that the civil rights movement was, was demonstrating and, and modeling, but also as a kind of backlash against, against the claims that were being made about the position of white privilege in our culture. The minute, the minute white supremacy is the center point of discussion in national debate, that's the moment when suddenly all these people see something cease to be white and they, they want to be they want to claim something else it's a so the white ethnic revival this isn't the only thing it is i think it's many things but one of the things it is is a kind of disavowal of straight ahead whiteness and a disavowal of white privilege um on the part of of people who now either didn't feel that they fully inhabited the space of that privileged whiteness that is that they heard discussed uh or you know, saw in the language of their own group identity um, a tool or an instrument for meeting what they saw as the challenges of the civil rights movement's claims against, against whiteness. So that's, that's the kind of beginnings of a politics of grievance. And you see it, um, it plays out in the debates over affirmative action. It plays out in the kind of cyclical debates we have about reparations, like why, why should I pay reparations? My grandparents got here in the 1890s, you know, as though 
you know, there's no, there's, there's no other kind of white privilege other than slaveholding, right? There's, there's no 20th century aspect of this that we need to interrogate or think about. So the white ethnic revival has been in some quarters a very useful instrument for trying to dismantle some of the claims of, of um, the civil rights and post-civil rights era. The real weaponization though comes, I think, in the Obama years. I think that it's unleashed in a different way. It's unleashed with a lack of nuance. It's unleashed with a frankness. It's unleashed with a venom and a, and a vigor um, that was more hidden in the years between, you know, between Nixon and Bush W. You know, there was, the ideas were there, but in polite society, there were certain things that just weren't said. And suddenly in the Obama years, um, you know, people were saying them and it started with the Tea Party. It started with the, the, the language of, of um, the language of conquest and, and um, as, though, as though Obama was an occupying army. You know, there was this, just this, this language of white displacement that became much more frank and much more energetic in the, during the Obama years. And when you look closely, really closely at the Obama years from, you know, that, that strategic meeting of Republicans on the night of the inauguration when they promised each other they weren't going to let Obama accomplish a single thing, like that was their pact. From there to the emergence of the Tea Party a few weeks later to the 2010 election and through all of the filibustering and the, and the voter suppression and all of that, um, the Obama years were a perfect map for what we were going to see in the Trump years. And, and all of that has become even more frank and more kind of out in the open um, since the, the 2016 election, to the extent that we have white nationalists kind of frankly and unabashedly marching in the streets. And that's an important connection between the Obama and Trump administration because so many people have argued that Trump came out of nowhere, that it was a surprise, right? Yeah, no, I think that, you know, it's our, our our politics is dialectical, and you don't you don't get an Obama without the the catastrophes of W, and you don't get a Trump without the kind of politics of resentment and grievance and disaffection and straight ahead racism um, that emerged um, during the Obama years. Thank you. So, um, so this question is piggybacking. I know I sent you a prompt about intersectionality, but this is actually a question that's been asked, and it's really about multiracial, biracial, right identities. Um, both, right, the history of that pre, pre, um, pre, pre Jim Crow, even, and then sort of moving today in terms of thinking about that idea of the one drop rule, right? Yeah. Um, which had a very right, and we can think about then who gets to who gets counted as white and what that means in terms of the one drop rule. So. So the question here is really about, could you talk a little bit about that, that idea of the one drop rule, the sure. movement in terms of uh, sort of racial ident um, identifications in that, in that regard? And the question goes on to say, would a multiracial person say like, uh, like Alexander Dumas be considered a free white person in the eyes of right, the law in 1790 or now? But, but, but that's, that, that, that's the end of the question, but you understand sort of the framing. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I'm going to go way back because I'm a historian. Um, so the, you know, the, the Big Bang, as a, to take an astronomical metaphor, um, the Big Bang of the kind of global politics that we live with now was um, a, a European expansionism and conquest that determined that Africa was going to be the continent to be plundered and whose peoples were going to be um, enlisted um, as, as, as labor, as enslaved labor. And that North America was the continent that was to be built up and whose, whose um, indigenous populations were to be displaced. And one of the things that you get out of that is two contending and very different models of racialization. Um, the one drop rule is designed to keep people black and therefore to keep them enslaved. And the blood quantum rules that go into you know, tribal membership and all of these um, kind of 
the the kind of biology of grouphood as it's as it's deployed in the case of the native nations is absolutely the opposite. It's designed to make them disappear and to to make their to weaken their their tribal claims. So those two things live side by side, and you know, and of course, our our population, you know, from the very beginning has um, has been you know completely mixed in in whatever ways you want. I mean, socially. Um, you know, genetically, however you want to talk about it. Like there's the, the idea of pure races is, is pretty much absurd in, in the North American context um, and in most contexts. Um, so the politics of peoplehood as in the kind of biologized or genetic ways that race is figured um, are, are very changeable and very complicated. And the question to always be asked is, you know, to whose benefit? Like, what, what is the political use that this category is being put to? Um, and it becomes very complicated because, for example, um, well, I'll give you just two very quick examples. Racialized Irish immigrants in the 19th century found a real use in their own racialization as Celts because it comported well with their, their own sense of their history under Saxon oppression in Ireland and now in the US as well. So Celtic identity actually, um, as much as it was a kind of pariah term voiced by, by Anglo-Saxon patricians in a city like Boston, it was also embraced by, by Irish firebrands on both sides of the Atlantic because it was a really usable kind of political category um, and a way of galvanizing people. Um, the same could be said of, of um, African-American identity in, uh, in the post-civil rights years. I mean, we um, discipline after discipline after discipline from the humanities to the social sciences to the sciences has dismantled the idea of race as a kind of cohesive, coherent understanding of, of peoples and who's who and, and identities and, and all of that. And yet the, some of the civil rights victories in the mid 60s enshrined uh, in discrimination, anti-discrimination law, for example, a real use value in a kind of stabilized notion of blackness, right? So, so we can't just wish races away um, because they're, they're kind of, they've been written into our social realities in so many different ways. Um, but I think the question about, you know, multiracial identity, and this came up, um, it's come up around the, the last couple of census cycles. Um, the question always to ask is, is, you know, what are the political stakes? What are the, what, what is at stake politically in identifying one way and not in another? Um, what are the political costs of kind of opting out of, of um, blackness in a political context where, uh, where, you know, blackness is certainly not privilege, but blackness has provided a language of opposition that's been pretty coherent for a couple of generations now. So those are the kinds of questions I would ask. I mean, of, of, of racial categories in general, like who, who is served by this? Um, where does it come from? What's its history? What's its historicity? Um, but what's what's really what's being accomplished by this um, deployment of a certain racial category at a certain time? I don't know if that answers your question or not. It did. It did. I mean, I, I think it did. I mean, it's you know, it's a question from the audience, so we'll we'll uh, we'll see if they have a follow up one. But my so that actually leads to another question that's being asked from the audience, which is about this idea of self government right oh i'm sorry you cut out for one uh, second sorry self-governance so uh -huh. who gets to self-govern and so this question is um basically the person is asking that part of your conversation is they're talking about the co-opting of racial justice language um by some by progressive or progressives or anti-progressives right and, and to advance particular kinds of political goals or political agendas and so this question is what would you say to those, to, to folks, to remind them that they might be replicating racial hierarchies and ideas of who can self-govern by essentially, right, taking this language or these, uh, these platforms and, um, and co-opting them? Um, and so the question goes on to say, uh, do you, 
do you think this is an issue? And I'd love, just love to hear your thoughts on it. Sorry. Okay. Sure. I'm reading the questions as I yeah, come. Yeah. Well, let me take this angle of vision on it. And if I don't answer the question, you can push me on it. But where, where it leads me in my own thinking is, <laughs> we can go, to, go back to 1790 for a second. You know, that, that model of we the people and others, right? The people who are included and the people who are excluded. Um, one way of thinking about this is that that paradigm really has structured what you might call identity politics in our country from, from the very beginning. Um, the free white person's clause is identity politics par excellence. And we think of identity politics as being basically a kind of civil rights era or post-civil rights phenomenon, the phenomenon of the kind of era of, of multiculturalism and diversity and all of that. But the, the inclusions and exclusions of we the people have, have basically face people with, with two choices. The people who are on the outside of that circle, the people who are excluded, who are fighting to get in, have two choices. One choice is to say, you're mistaken. We're just like you. Let us in to the circle of we the people and we will show you that, that you know, this is a libel and, and uh, we will prove to you that, that we're just like you. There's no difference. So that's the argument from sameness. That's the assimilationist argument. Then there's the, the pluralist argument, which has become more common in the post-civil rights years, but you see versions of it all along. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois, for example, making the argument from difference, that yes, you're, you're right that we're different from you. You're wrong that there's a hierarchy here. You're wrong that we're inferior to you, but you're right that we're different. And if you let us in, you'll see that we have special gifts to bring to the Republic that will be enriching of the nation at large. Those are the two basic choices, the assimilationist and the pluralist. And those choices structure the kind of identity politics of, of every group I know anything about, whether it's African-American politics, whether it's, it's um, immigrant politics in the Yiddish ghettos in the 1890s or, or among Koreans in the suburbs in the, in the 1990s. Um, American feminism, both in the 1920s and the 1970s, is structured according to those, those two different pathways, the argument from sameness and the argument from difference. And, and in that, and here's where I get to your question, is written a tendency to replicate some of the problems because as long as you're fighting in to get your way into the circle, you're probably not disrupting the logic that there is a circle. Right, so you're always you're kind of leaving the exclusionary principles intact while you're making an argument on your own behalf, and I think that um, that's that's one of the reasons why writing about race, thinking about race, but certainly um, organizing activism around race is incredibly complicated because it is very easy to replicate some of the very things that you're that you're trying to dispense with. And there's a follow-up, I don't, I don't know if this is from the same person, but it's similar, similar vein, which is these connections between unfitness for self-government and poverty and mass incarceration, um, uh, whether it's in the United States or outside in Brazil, places like that. And so I think part of what the, because uh, there's several questions here now about this idea of unfitness that I'm seeing. Um, so do you see those connections as as being exacerbated as we move right from one historical moment to to the next, meaning right as we come out of the um, even the post civil rights era, the civil rights era, right? That there's sort of um, a re, um, a re a doubling down, if you will, yeah. on this idea of of unfitness. Yeah. No. I. That's a really that's a great question, and and I want to be careful because I. I don't think, so the short answer is yes, that, that those deeper histories of the idea of unfitness are, are um, they're deep in the political culture and they surface in various ways. Um, you can see it, I mean, even like the, the, at the end of the 19th century, there was, there, people would talk about the deserving poor and the undeserving poor, and it's a similar kind of idea. Um, I think that 
you can similarly see that some of our criminal justice issues around policing and around incarceration map pretty well onto a logic of, of who is fit and who is not. The important thing, I, they aren't coeval. They aren't exactly the same thing. They aren't identical to each other. But I do think that the one gives shape to the other. You know, the same way that, that um, the idea that the, the, that the Vietnamese people were not fit for their own self-government gave shape to many of the kinds of policies that were undertaken um, to prop up, to prop up um, puppet governments for one thing, but also just that idea that to, to save them, we're gonna have to destroy them. To save the village, we're gonna have to destroy the village because there's, there's nothing inherently fit about the village itself, right? So that's an idea that it's not coeval with the idea of fitness for self-government, but it's, it's shaped by it, it, it's influenced by it. And I, I would say the same thing about some of what we're seeing around contemporary um, debates around uh, the carceral state, debates around criminal justice in general and policing and sentencing, um, debates, uh, as you said, around poverty. I think that that, that deep notion of fitness and unfitness um, I think it's always it's worth probing in these contexts because I do think that there's there's something going on there. So uh, this is another question from the audience. Um, America is a young country by definition. Um, and so do you think that the rapid progression of the US as a quote unquote world superpower has contributed to the illusion that we're more established than we actually are? And then do you think that this illusion is part of the reason America is so reluctant to amend, right? And we know how many amendments there have been to the constitution or lack thereof, to amend or change um, laws, right? The sort of legal or juridical, um, um, sen there are juridical sensibilities. Oh. The superpower status, I think I would just say is, is a later chapter of, of something that goes back earlier to the kind of, you know, the strange, the strange compound um, of being born as a country um, that is anti-imperial by definition, but, but wants to be an empire from the very beginning, right? New York is the empire state. Right. They, they were pretty. They were pretty unabashed about it. Like their, their their dreams were right out there, and I think that 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 kind of um, contradiction is is part of what gives rise to an American exceptionalism that is such a source of bedevilment around all of these issues. I think that the superpower status, what emerges, what emerges in the mid twentieth century, is. Um, is a kind of national hubris that is very much related to that initial hubris of the of the kind of anti-imperial slash imperial dream. Um, I think where we are now, well, I don't know, this is going to take a turn away maybe from the question, we can come back to the heart of the question. But I, I do think that one of the things that we're living with now is, is um, reckoning in a way that we really haven't fully with um, what it means to live in the post-Cold War world. I mean, you know, the argument was that, that the Cold War is over, we won. And there's actually another take on this, which is the Cold War is over and both superpowers lost. And they, they lost in one way and we're losing in another way. And, and, and we can see it every day, the way that we're, we lost the Cold War. We can see it in, you know, the, the so-called war on terror comes out of just horrendous um, late Cold War policies that were undertaken in the Middle East. And um, so in some ways, 9-11 is a later chapter of the Cold War. And what we're seeing with the, the rise of Putin and, and Putin's interventions in, uh, in our own politics, um, you know, we're reaping the whirlwind of, of our own failure to really um, think about what the post-Cold War world might look like um, and to not reckon with that. So that's just one of many areas for what we really need is kind of truth and reconciliation um, and a, a full reckoning. Um, but back to the, to the question about um, amending ourselves, I, th I do think it's rooted in that, that um, very self-flattering and self-serving um, notion of national greatness. You know, that there's, there's nothing to amend. And, you know, 
racism, for example, inequality, these are things that are like minor, minor blots on our otherwise grand history, but they aren't integral and they, they don't require much of our attention. Thank you. So my next question also comes from the audience, which is, and it's uh, how might, so th there are several questions about the discussion that you had about sort of the white ethnic revival, right? And so, um, so, there, so I'm going to morph a couple of questions here together. Right. But how might, given, the, given this idea of this revival, right, and sort of the mo movement to and from and proximity to white privilege, how, right, do we have these conversations about right, right privilege, recognizing, right, that there is differentiation within whiteness, just like there's differentiation within blackness and other, right, identities. Um, and then how do we also reckon, to use your words, with the histories of some of these legacies, of whether it's Italian Americans or Irish Americans or whatever, which actually also contributed to some of the racialized and discriminatory racialized paradigms yeah. that we see now. The question is about Columbus, actually, but I'm broadening it to say, okay. Okay, right, the larger sort of sensibilities there. Um, yeah. oh, there that's the question. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things to say here is that, um, well, as in all things, I think historical clear-sightedness is, gets us pretty far down the road in, in understanding and, and um, dealing with things that as a society we haven't necessarily dealt with. So, so, you know, the impulse to take that roots trip, you know, and to think about one's own kind of family history and, the, and what that looks like is not necessarily a bad one if it's undertaken um, honestly and, and fully. So, you know, if you look at your, you know, Italian grandparents' lives and, and how they refracted down through uh, American history once they arrived at Castle Garden uh, or Ellis Island, um, you recognize this, the importance of things like Jim Crow unions. You recognize the importance of things like the GI Bill um, and um, housing and banking policies and loans, underwritten loans uh, and uh, home, ownership, home ownership opportunities that had everything to do with their whiteness, right? So there's, there's a structure of whiteness that underlies these particularistic histories of all these different groups. And, and that's just left out. Nobody wants to talk about that. No, because, because in their Italianness or their Jewishness or their Irishness they, or their Greekness, they don't want to talk about white privilege. They want to talk about the special aspects of their own history. So, so undertaking the Roots Project you know, with, with eyes wide open um, is not a bad thing and, and can be productive. The other thing, though, there are models for this. There are people like Tom Hayden is a great example. He's a person who, who deployed his Irishness on behalf of a kind of American progressive vision um, that was just really interesting. And, and, you know, there are dozens of, of white second wave feminists who you would say the same thing. Like it was, it was their kind of world of our mothers, um, kind of roots trip Ellis Island um, saga that brought them to a very particular version of American feminism. And, and you see that in the new left all over the place. I mean, the, you see that in, um, you know, post-war Jewish youth, you see it in people like Tom Hayden, um, the kind of outgrowths of the Catholic worker. There are all kinds of people who took that white ethnic roots trip and, and really turned it into a tool of a kind of coalition building kind of politics that I don't think we should, I don't think we should lose sight of it. And I don't think we should lose hope, even though it's also the case that, um, that the right has made a lot of use of those narratives as well. Thank you. Um, and so the last few questions here are, um, really around these under a sort of thinking about our cultural understandings and, and particularly here in the US. And so one of the questions is really about how we use history to strategically, right, then, you know, sort of understand where we are, where we've come from. And then how do we think about 
right, dismantling, right, some of the things that we see today. So how do we take action steps in terms of employing that history that you're talking about, right, to make substantive and impactful change, whether that's within our institutions or, you know, within politics, et cetera. And there are a couple of questions around that. And I'm going to foreground that my last question, which will probably be, and it's both from the audience, right, some concrete steps that we can take. So maybe you'll integrate that. And, sure. You know, yeah. Yeah. The what to do questions are always hard. Um, let me personalize it. Let me just say what you should do should be based on, on who you understand yourself to be. So my answer for what I should do is not going to be the same as my answer for what any of the 246 people in our audience should do. I think that that self-knowledge is really crucial in any kind of activism and political work. Don't try to do something you're not capable of. Don't try to do something that you're not located properly for, kind of just in, in, in social terms, right? Um, so for me, you know, teaching and writing and public speaking is, is part of what I do because I'm, I'm convinced that um, it's not the whole battle, but it lays the ground for a different kind of battle when certain things are known. Like if everybody in the country knew about the 1790 naturalization law, we could have a very different kind of conversation about how inequality works in this country. If everybody knew about the homeowners loan corporation and the kind of racist redlining policies of, of homeowners loans in the 1930s and 40s, we could have a very different kind of national discussion of the evisceration of urban spaces in the second part of the, the 20th century and a different kind of conversation about gentrification in the 21st century, right? So knowledge, I do think is power. And, and that's my own personal answer to your question is study, read, write, talk to as many different kinds of people as you can. Um, I think taking to the streets is important. And I think that uh, in the context of a pandemic that's challenging and, and anybody has my blessing if they decide to stay home for the next, you know, whatever. But I do think that um, protest matters. I think that it is, you know, we talked a little bit earlier. I think it is a moment where the nation by which, you know, I mean white people and, and white people in power, but I do, I also mean the nation kind of broadly conceived in all of its diversity and all of its kind of multivocality. I think the nation is, is ready to hear things about its own history now, um, maybe more generously than it was ready for a generation ago. Um, and so, and I think protest does some of that work. I think, you know, the culture does some of that work. There are brilliant culture workers in music and in film. I mean, you know, Ava DuVernay, people like that, um, who are really, you know, who are getting an audience and who are doing really eye-opening work. I think that kind of work is important. So I think that, you know, the way we win these battles is by working on, on every single dimension there is, but you figure out where your own strengths are and what, what you're best at, what you have to contribute, what your best um, contribution is gonna be. And you go, you ride that as far as you can. That's, that's my best personal advice. Um, I'd also say vote, 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 vote. If you're looking for something to do with the next 90 days, vote, help people vote, help people register to vote, get people out. I mean, we're in a real emergency. And I think, you know, if, if this election goes one way, we're in one kind of world. If this election goes the other way, we're in a very different kind of world. And I think we have to recognize that and like just really focus um, on, on November 3rd. Thank you. And I have one last question, which really is about competing discourses. And so this is, I'm again bringing some of the questions together, which is around anti-racism, anti-Semitism, um, anti-Islamophobia, um, anti-Xenophobia, particularly directed across uh, um, Asian, uh, uh, Asian Pacific Islander communities, right? And then uh, uh, the ways in which uh, right, um, genocide against indigenous communities. But sometimes what happens is these are seen as competing discourses, exactly. right? And then we begin to say, well, look at that person who's, you know, this black person who said this about th 
the, the Asian Americans or this uh, Asian American who said this about um, uh, uh, the, the Irish, whatever it is. So could you talk a little bit about how that works in terms of those competing discourses and what action steps we can take to come together perhaps as we mm -hmm. think about right the new, um, whether it's the election in terms of thinking about voting or steps that we can take to think about how that is operationalized, both historically and in the contemporary moment, to actually exclude and keep um, in terms of the po politics of communal power? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, you know, this is another of those things that I think is it's structured. It's, it's structured in our history to not see the common cause between different groups based on different experience because the experiences are completely different and i think that you know to our great detriment since really since you know multiculturalism became a thing in the 70s or so um in our in our k through 12 schools we've tended to talk about diversity um in cultural terms, like a, like it's a smorgasbord of languages and religions and beliefs and you know um, wardrobe and costumes and you know, but we don't talk about the power differentials that underwrite it. So our two favorite metaphors are the melting pot on the one hand and you know the potato salad or the mosaic on the other, and they're two very different ways of conceptualizing our nation's diversity. But the thing that they have in common is that they drop out the whole notion of power relations and what we really need to think of diversity means not just that we're coming from different places and that that having a, a kind of chinese background is different from having a russian jewish background is different than having a, a southern african american background but but that those are three very different juridical spaces to occupy and what we need is a paradigm that allows us to see each other's juridical spaces, right? And to see the way that the nation is not just like infused with different peoples, but is, has been built on histories and collision. And we need a paradigm. You know, I think of people like Ron Takaki, I think of um, more recently people like um, uh, Kelly Lytle Hernandez, great book on, on incarceration in Los Angeles, and her first book too, actually, on, on La Migra, um, are people who are really trying to think across the silos of peoplehood and discipline to kind of bring these stories together and think about, well, how, how does indigenous studies inform what we know of um, the black experience in California? You know, or how might um, Asian American history and Latino studies inform the ways that we're thinking about European immigration? Um, so I think that, that we need to build those kinds of bridges in our own analysis. Um, and I think, you know, the disciplines have, have replicated those silos for the most part until pretty recently. So, you know, when I was in graduate school in the 80s, you know, it's almost shocking to say now, but it was absolutely possible to say that you wanted to study immigration and never read a single book about Asian immigration. Like you could just do that. Like that was a thing, you could do that. We aren't there anymore, but we still are in these kind of conceptual silos where we're not, we're not really getting our head around the full histories. And I think we need to think relationally, we need to think um, uh, across the silos, we need to think in, in broad paradigms that are encompassing of all of these different histories and collusion um, in a way that will help us understanding, understand our common political culture without pitting us against each other in the ways that we're kind of thinking about our own oppressions. Well, thank you very much. I think that uh, is a great way to end. Think about how we can come together in all kinds of ways. Thank you for this discussion. I can't thank tell you, you um, I know you're, you're not seeing all of this, but we're getting some very positive feedback. So thank you very much. I know we did not get to lots of the questions, um, but we will try to integrate some of this information into, um, into the guides and the reading guides as we move forward. And of course, uh, some of you have already written, we will be having more discussions um, with authors and scholars such as uh, Dr. Jacobson. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for this discussion, Dr. Jacobson. Thank I think you, you provided an incredible um, uh, pathway forward, but also allowing us to reflect on these very salient and important histories and legacies that are still with us today. So thank, thank you, you everyone for joining us. We will shut off now. Be well, take care, take care of yourself and others. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>